Hi, I'm Jerry Henwood, host of Let's Talk About It, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Jeffrey Smith, who is the artistic director of the Philadelphia Boys Choir. Jeff, welcome very much. To Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Sure, sure. Well, the Philadelphia Boys Choir is a wonderful organization, and uh, in reading some of its background, uh, I'd like to know a, a little bit about how it started and when it started. Could you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, well, it started in the 60s. Uh, actually, it's part of the school district. You know, uh, we have an all-city orchestra, an all-city choir. Well, there was an all-city boys choir uh, in Philadelphia, and uh, this basically drew the kids from the whole city, the best kids of their schools. I believe at the time it was the teachers themselves, the music teachers, picking some of their best singers and sending them to this boys' choir. Um, I don't know too much of the history back then. We don't have um, a lot of uh, information or archives about it, but uh, around 1968, uh, oh, at that time, in the early 60s, it was led by a gentleman named Carlton Lake. And in 1968, Robert Hamilton took over this choir. And um, he made a lot of changes, and he started auditioning the kids himself. And eventually decided to break away from the school district and become its own nonprofit. And um, at that point, it was open up for all kids to audition as opposed to chosen from their schools. And um, actually eventually uh, from outside the city as well. So anyone, any boy who was interested in being in this choir and in representing the city and w was able to commute in for rehearsals twice a week, they were certainly welcome to audition. Um, and so then over those 50 years, we've had kids from all over, uh, from all walks of life. And, um, and now we, here we are over 50 years later, still going strong. Now, I know that you yourself participated when you were a student in the Boys Choir, Philadelphia Boys Choir. And how did you hear about the opportunity to become part of that organization? Do you recall? Well, it was my parents. And for most kids, it's their parents. You know, I was eight at the time, eight years old. And I believe my parents knew a boy near, that lived near them that was in the choir. And uh, they knew my parents had recognized that I had some musical ability. I had been taking piano lessons for a few years, and they thought this might be something good for me. So they they found out about when the auditions were, and they took me there. And I didn't know anything about it, and I was very hesitant. I was actually, I think I was crying in the car, saying, <laughs> I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And they said, just give it a shot. And oh, I don't want to do this. Well. I auditioned, you know, I'm eight years old, little kid, you know. So I sang for the conductor, Dr. Hamilton, and uh, he said, oh, he's in, he's in, we'd love to have him, and I was thrilled. <laughs> and what, what uh, uh, did you sing soprano as an eight-year-old, uh, do you remember? I honestly don't remember. Ultimately, I became an alto, um, but I, I, had, I had a big range. As uh -huh. most kids that age usually have a pretty big range. They can sing some of the higher notes and some of the lower notes. Um, but uh, I was just nervous because I didn't know anything about it. But once he said I could do it, I was happy to do it. You know, sure, I was thrilled. Sure, sure. Now, you may never have been asked this question. I don't know. but uh, And it's not a question that I had posed to you uh, previous to our interview today. Mm -hmm. But do you remember, put yourself in the position of Jeff Smith, 8-year-old, 9-year-old, 10-year-old, uh, as you were growing up and participating in the choir. Uh, what did you derive from being a member of that musical group? Well, first of all, the musical training that you get there is unlike anything you can get anywhere else at that age. You know, <clears throat> there are a lot of a lot of schools that have great music programs, and you're you're getting great training. We see. <laughs> but this, sorry, that's all right. Uh, but this is. Uh, this is a step above that because you're taking the best kids in the area and it, you know similar to an all city group where you've you've got the best of the best so you can really bring it up a notch but um, this isn't just a few weeks in the year we're meeting all year round so we really get into some heavy repertoire and some complicated musical um, theory that you know you don't get at that age so it really helped develop me as a musician and uh, furthermore to work with a great conductor like that and um, to learn a little bit about conducting. I mean, I, I really kind of got the bug for conducting at a young age. 
um, and not just choral conducting, also orchestral conducting and everything that goes with it. And then beyond the musical training, you know, the kids, I, I, I think the kids still feel this way, but there was certainly a sense of pride in being in, in that organization. I mean, we, we knew this was, a, this was a big deal, and we get to sing on TV, and we get to perform with the Philadelphia Orchestra, and, uh, and then furthermore, we, when we travel internationally each year, we, we get to represent our country, and, you know, we often meet with dignitaries in those countries, and so we really felt like we were part of something important. And I know the boys today still feel that. Oh, that's wonderful because there aren't many opportunities, I think, as a former educator, for students to uh, experience those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I know that it influenced you greatly because you went on to uh, study music at Ithaca College mm -hmm. and uh, eventually become artistic director of the Philadelphia Boys Choir yourself. And that happened in 2004, yes, right? Yes, yes. Okay, now, uh, do you recall what that interview process was like uh, that distinguished you in order for you to be selected? Well, it was a unique experience because I was taking over for the man who had conducted this choir for 37 years. And um, he, he, he created this you know he, he created he established so many of the traditions of the choir and and got us in with the orchestra and the opera and the ballet and there was just so much that he had done um, and so to to have someone take over that was um, well the organization had never been through that before to, to find a replacement of someone who had conducted that long so it wasn't your typical interview process in fact Basically, I was chosen by Dr. Hamilton to succeed him. Um, I was up at, as you mentioned, I went to Ithaca College, and shortly after, or right after I graduated, I went to New York City. And um, at that point, my intention was to conduct musical theater. And so I was working um, with some shows on and off Broadway, uh, playing keyboard and conducting a little bit. And um, Dr. Hamilton had remembered me as a, as a kid in the choir and had seen my abilities even at that age, but I was, al was also keeping tabs on my career and where things were going. And, um, and I, I think even before he called me, he kind of had his eye on me as a possible successor for him. And, um, but finally in 2001, there was an opportunity had arisen where his, uh, the accompanist for the uh, the, the accompanist for the choir was not able to join them on their tour that year, the tour to China and Korea, and so he needed somebody to accompany on piano the choir, and so that's when he called me and said, "Listen, I need a great pianist to accompany us a free trip to China and Korea." You know, I said, "Great, I'd love to go to China and Korea." So I I accompanied them, and um, that kind of started the ball rolling. And uh, shortly after that, he let me know that he was thinking of retiring, and he had his eye on me as, as to possibly replace him. And what did I think? I said, no way. <laughs> I said, no way. This is too much. This was his life, you know, 24-7. This was a huge job. I was married, and we wanted to start a family. Um, I didn't know if, it, you know, I didn't know if it could happen, um, if it was feasible, you know. But... Um, after ruminating on a few months and praying about it, um, at one point I said, you know, I think this, this might be where I need to go. And my wife said this, she said, you know, I was kind of thinking the same thing. I said, well, I think maybe this is what we need to do. So I called him up. I said, all right, let's do this. So I, we moved back down to the area, to the Philly area. And um, I came on as assistant conductor, a full-time assistant conductor for a year or two. And um, and then after that, I took over. I mean, I did meet with the board of directors, and they had some questions and, and wanted to get to know me. And, and while I was there as assistant conductor, they they got to know me and see my abilities and qualifications, and, and then it happened. But there was no actual official interview process. Now, I would imagine, uh, because you're in the role, not only uh, that of artistic director, but... I'm sure that they were looking to someone who could interact well with the students, with the boys. Uh, 
because, you know, I'm thinking about uh, those students who come to you and they're initially resistant. Mm. And so how do you uh, help them uh, to become less resistant, uh, more accepting, and eventually absolutely enjoy being in the choir? Right. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because in some ways I have a very different personality than Dr. Hamilton in our approach to that. We both get the, got the job done well, but in different ways. Um, you know, for me, I just find the key is just being friendly. Mm -hmm. Being friendly and and honest with the kids. I think kids really can can tell when you're being sincere or not. And um, so if you're being honest with them and, you know, but friendly, not too harsh, then they start to, they get a little more comfortable and they're willing to, you know, if you're, as you're giving them instruction, you know, try this, maybe open your mouth more, or this or that. They're more open to that, and eventually they see how it's helping them, and they, they get into it. And once they're in the, and that's, I'm talking kind of in the audition process when I'm first mm -hmm. getting to know the kid. Once they're in the program, of course, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, they're seeing, we're, we're interacting with them frequently, and um, they're, they're learning a lot. They're meeting other kids. They're singing, which they enjoy. They're learning songs, which they enjoy. And so it's, it's very natural for them to, you know, to become attached to the program. Right. Now, how many boys are there in the choir? Well, we have, uh, we have two training groups and then the performing choir. So our, our youngest training groups, there's about 20 in the youngest and about 30 in the, in the next training group. And in the performing choir, we have, um, we have two parts of the choir. It's, it's the, what we call the choir and the chorale. And the choir are basically the sopranos and altos. And uh, so they're boys between ages maybe 10 and 14. And there's about 80 boys in the performing choir. And in our chorale are the tenors and basses. And those are older boys and men. And, uh, and some of those men are fathers of kids in the choir, or some of them are just alumni who've been in you know, since they were kids. Some of them are just friends, people who live in the area that love to sing and audition to be in the choir. So we've got about 40 or so of those older boys and men in the choral. So the choir and choral, the 80 and the 40 combine, and most of our performances are with the choir and choral together. So about 120 singers all together. I see. Now, what is the audition process like? What, uh, you know, how long is it? What are you looking for? Uh, could you Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, as I mentioned, we take boys from the whole area, so anyone who's interested in coming is welcome to audition. Um, I often go to the schools in the area, to different schools, any school where I can get a connection, where they think they have some boys for me to hear, I'm happy to go hear them. Um, so I've got maybe 20 or so schools that I, I go to in the spring and uh, usually connected through the music teacher there, sometimes through the principal. And um, I'll go and hear, you know, maybe 15 or 20 boys at that school. And uh, usually we're looking for the youngest boys, seven or eight years old, so that they're young enough to go into our training programs before the performing choir. And in that ad audition, basically, I, we just vocalize a little bit. We'll do a little five-note scale up and down, and I keep going up to, to hear how high uh, their voices go or how high they're willing to go, because uh, to be honest, a lot of times with boys, um, they're not. It's not a matter of they're not able to sing the high notes. It's just they're not. They they're not used to it, and they don't know how to do it. And um, there's a little bit of a stigma, of course, with boys singing high notes. You know, boys are supposed to be strong and sing low notes. So uh, I'm sure that's a part of it culturally. But usually, the younger they are, it's easier. So if I'm hearing them at seven or eight, it's pretty easy to get them up into those higher notes and they feel comfortable with it. And, and I'm demonstrating singing those high notes with them so they think, well, if this guy can do it, I guess I can do it. You know? <laughs> so anyway, we, we vocalize a little bit to get a sense of how, how well they are to sing on the higher notes. And then I ask them to sing any song they want. And um, so some of them have prepared a song, maybe a pop song they heard on the radio or something they learned in school or church or temple or wherever. And, um, or if they can't think of something, I'll have them sing happy birthday or the alphabet or, again, something very simple. And then I'll play uh, a pattern of notes, like five or six notes, just a little melody. And I say, okay, sing that back to me. And that's just to hear how 
how quickly they can learn a tune, you mm -hmm. know. And so that's that process. And then from there, I will contact the families and let them know who we'd like to call back. And um, so then we call them back in the summer to do a callback audition at our facility. Now, to be honest, this initial audition at the school is really just a way for us to get the word out and to bring people in. Uh, you don't have to do that audition. Anyone's welcome to just call us and do a summer audition. But we go to the schools, again, just to let people know, hey, we're here, we're doing auditions, and it makes it a little bit easier for you to, to get your foot in the door. I'm, going, I'm coming to your area. You know, you don't have to come out. And if, you're, if your son's not quite qualified, then we'll save you the trip of coming mm -hmm. in, you know. But again, anyone is welcome to uh, sign up for an audition at the building. So in the summer, we do those callback auditions. And the callback audition is very similar to the initial audition. I just spend a little more time. And it's just one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not hearing a bunch of boys at one time. It's just one boy. Um, and we vocalize. And they sing a song for me. And I'll play some notes. And sometimes I'll play two or three notes together and ask them to sing different notes in, in that combination. And um, the main thing I'm listening for is their ability to learn music and to hear harmonies. Mm -hmm. Because in the performing choir and chorale, we sing up to eight-part harmony. So I need to know that they're going to be able to hear their note in this eight-part chord and not get swayed by it. Sure, you know? sure. And uh, even at that age, no, I don't expect them to sing eight-part harmony at eight years old, but I just need to know, listen, if, can you hear these notes? Um, if I have you sing that, can you sing that while I sing something else? And, and sometimes they have difficulty with that, so I may try it a different way. You know, mm -hmm. some of the exercises I'm doing are a little foreign to them, so I'll f try to find another way around it to, to get to what we're ultimately trying to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully they can latch on to it. Right. And then, you know, there, there's other things I'm listening for, too. Uh, for instance, the quality of their voice. Um, but more times than not, if the quality of their voice isn't what we're looking for, it's simply because they're not singing well. They're not, you know, they have some bad vocal habits that they've picked up over the years. And um, that's something we can work with either through um, our rehearsals or with one-on-one -on -one voice lessons. Mm -hmm. Someone to teach them, you know, you don't strain like this when you're going for the high notes and you don't tighten up, you know, and um, you don't pull your tongue all the way back. And some things any voice teacher would tell you, but a lot of little kids don't know yet, and of course they don't know. They, sure. they haven't been trained yet. Now, you, you mentioned uh, that there were two practices a week. Uh, there still are two practices a week? Yes. And when are they? Well, if they're in the training program, they're Tuesdays and Fridays after school. Uh, they start at 4.30. And if they're in the performing choir, it's Wednesdays after school and Saturday mornings. And what's the duration of the rehearsals? Uh, for the training program, okay. it's an hour and 15 minutes each time. And for the performing choir, it's an hour and 15 on the Wednesday, and Saturday morning's three hours, 9 to 12. Now, as the artistic director, are you responsible for what the boys sing in their performances? Yes. Yeah, so I put together the programs, I teach it to them, I conduct the performances. And where are some of the places you've sung? Uh, well, locally, we've sung everywhere. <laughs> you know, we sing, uh, we sing at the Kimmel Center every year. Um, for our own season finale concert as well as the Philly Pops holiday concerts. Uh, we sing at the Academy of Music um, with the ballet for the Nutcracker production and sometimes the opera company. Uh, opera, opera Philadelphia would sometimes have us in some of their productions um, or sometimes other events at the Academy. Uh, we've sung at City Hall for different government functions. Uh, we've sung in many churches around the city you know, really anywhere you can think of. We've sung right. in the stadiums, uh, sometimes for sporting events, sometimes for other events. Now, you also travel across the country and internationally. Yes. Now, how does, how does all that happen, and who finances all of that? Well, um, <clears throat> we basically, throughout the year, we are singing in this area, so in Philadelphia and the surrounding areas. Occasionally, we might go up to New York, take a bus up there, or, or down to D.C., but it's, it's mostly in this area. And then once a year, we take in a trip. And it's usually international. Occasionally, it will be domestic and, you know, we'll go out west or south or wherever. Um, but it's usually international, and that is funded by the parents. Uh, we have been working towards some of our own revenue going towards that, but it's, it's 
frankly, it's just costly, mm -hmm. um, especially because, you know, this past year, this summer we were in Italy, we had 120 singers uh, going on tour. And nowadays the cost of traveling is near $4,000 a person. So uh, currently that is paid for by the parents, but we do have some scholarships available. So if a kid's not able to go for financial reasons, uh, we can help out maybe one or two each year. Uh, so we try to make sure that everyone who's been in the program has gone on at least one tour. But of course we love them to go on as many as possible. And uh, m you know, many of the families that uh, may be on scholarship to be in our program throughout the year for the tuition, um, many of them are able to come up with the funds for tour just because they are you know maybe not through themselves through their own income but through family and friends and other people their support system they're able to help to fund the tour so it's it's amazing some of these um some of these kids you thought i don't know if they're going to be able to go we may be able to help them out um, but what do you know their parents come up and say we've we've found people that are able to help support him on his trip now given the the travel schedule of the philadelphia boys choir can you tell us and share with us uh, a particularly memorable experience? There's a lot of memorable I'm sure, experiences. I'm sure, I'm uh, sure. You know, uh, my, one of my favorite trips is China. We've been, and we were just talking about that earlier. Um, the choir's been there maybe four or five times. I personally have been there three times with the choir. And I just love going there because of the difference in the culture, you know. Um, there's a lot of great places to go in Europe and, you know, everywhere. But for me, Europe is not as interesting just because a lot of American culture has come from some of the European culture. But the culture in Asia is just so, and tradition is just so unique that I think, I find it fascinating and interesting and exciting. And I, I think a lot of the boys do as well. Uh, this last trip we took to China was particularly interesting. It was a, it was a long trip, but we never do a trip this long, but it was 24 days and we visited 15 cities. And uh, it was basically a present, a concert presenter over there had had um, engaged us to perform in f these 15 concert halls throughout the country. So we got to see all the great stuff you would imagine from in Beijing, we went to Shanghai, uh, we actually stopped in Hong Kong for a little bit. Um, but then we saw all these cities that no one's ever heard of. Uh, or sorry, no one in America has ever heard of because there aren't any big sites there or any, any there's no tourism per se, anything um, that would interest Americans. Um, it's just people living their normal lives in China. And so it was a great opportunity for us to see this is what the country's like. You know, it's not the Great Wall. It's not the Forbidden City. Those are an important part of their culture and history, but that's not the way everybody <laughs> lives their lives right, day yeah. to day. So. It was a really unique experience. And while we were there, we actually got to, in Shenzhen, we got to have the boys uh, stay in the homes of the people of that city. So they got to live with the families uh, for a few days also, which is always a great experience. I'd say, you know, for most of our tours, the most memorable part usually ends up being the time they get to spend with the families. Mm -hmm. You know, living in the homes, seeing how the people live, and interacting with the people, you know, not just for a brief handshake here or there, but really getting to know them and, and, and realize that, you know, there are some cultural differences, but the people inside are the same everywhere and, you go. And what is the response of those, whether it's China or, or Italy, your most recent tour abroad, uh, what is the response of the people to the Philadelphia Boys Choir? Well. I think it's often just as memorable for them as it is for us um, because, first of all, as I mentioned before, the boys, the boys do have a sense of pride in being in the organization and they know when we go abroad, we are representing our country. We're representing the choir, we're representing our city, and we're representing our country. And so they take that seriously. And so they know the way they act, the way they behave, the way they perform, the way they interact with the people all reflects on our country and um, actually China was a perfect example in that these cities like I said most Americans don't visit so a lot of the times when we went there people had never seen Americans in person 
you know, so we'd be walking along and we'd get a lot of attention because here's a group of a bunch of Americans walking, what is this about, you know? <laughs> uh, so, so they take it seriously. Like, you may be the only impression that these people are get, have of Americans in real life. You know, they see stuff on TV, but now they're actually meeting an American and you may be the only impression they get. So you've, you've got to make a good impression. Right. And they do, they do. Um, they're respectful, they're polite, they're engaging, and they perform well, which impresses people too. And so it's the whole package. And, um, and it's a diverse group too. You know, we've got boys of all um, ethnic, racial, and um, socioeconomic backgrounds, which for a lot of countries when we visit, that's unique to them. You know, not only have they not seen Americans, but in some of the, again, in China in particular, in some of the cities, they had never seen an African-American person before. So that was unique to them. Mm -hmm. And then they had seen, we also have some Chinese students and, and other Asian students as well. And um, that, a lot of times that surprises, people aren't expecting that when we, when we visit. And uh, if I or anyone in our audience would like to come and hear the Philadelphia Boys Choir uh, this coming year, how could we find out where you'll be singing and yes. the dates? Well, certainly they are welcome to visit our website. Um, I don't know if we have them up yet, but our main concerts, we have three holiday concerts in December. So I would suggest in October or November as we get closer to check out those dates and times. And... Um, we have uh, our big season finale concert in June as well, which we're still working on scheduling. Um, so that would be our website, which is philly, that's P-H-I-L-L-Y, boyschoir.org, phillyboyschoir.org. And uh, I believe there's a link that says performances and events. So you go there and you can find them. So for, uh, for December, we, like I said, we have three holiday concerts, usually one on the main line, one in Philadelphia itself, and one in Jersey. Okay. Well, I want to tell you, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today about the Philadelphia Boys Choir, and I hope you, our audience, has learned a lot about it and uh, get to hear them in the near future. Thank you very much, and have a great day.